<laughs> well, Lachlan Giles, the man, the myth, the legend, the man we call Lockie Argy. Welcome back to the Gypsy Tales <laughs> podcast, mate. We just said before we started that I definitely thought this was going to be in studio and you were going to get the full studio experience. The first time we're in Thailand and now we're in COVID. So you've had two uh, out of the ordinary Gypsy Tales experiences. Yeah, I think I preferred the first setting. That was pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, a little, tiny bit better. If we could go back there, it would be good. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, I am quite uh, I'm quite keen to go back to Thailand and do a camp with you, mate. So I don't know when, I don't know when that's going to be able to happen, but I'll, I feel like people are going to be more desperate than ever to do those kind of things. I think so, yeah. I think um, it's going to be quite interesting to see it should be really interesting to see what happens when flights open mm. up again and because I feel like there'll be a huge demand, but I don't actually know if the airlines will be able to cope with it. I don't know what they're going to do. Yeah, I wonder yeah, what like, there. I wonder what infrastructure has been like super impacted to the point where it's like, yeah, even if things do open back up, it's like, hey, sorry guys, but uh, we, uh, we have to like fire everyone. So we're back in 1967 now as an airline. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I would say that wouldn't surprise me for some of them. I think they were um they don't run on particularly large margins, I don't think. But mm. it's crazy yeah. too, this whole COVID thing highlighted just how little runway the world has. Like we're so reliant yeah. on economy and um have you ever read Brave New World from Aldous Huxley? No, I haven't. It's good. Oh yeah, it's pretty interesting to read. It's but like in this time. I mean it's a it's a classic novel but um especially reading it in this time of a pandemic like the the whole thing is like society has just been completely cultivated and crafted and even back i think it was written in 46 i think but even back then yeah huxley was um just saying like the the economy runs on buying shit and throwing out the old shit and buying the new shit and it's just like, if that's the model, then you just don't have much runway when things go wrong. And it's like, things have gone wrong yeah. now. And man, there's just so many companies that they can't survive unless there is just this mass volume of consumerism. And um, I mean, yeah. but then you see other things have just exploded because uh, I guess the way that you can, if you can consume it from the couch, essentially, your business has boomed. And if you couldn't consume yeah. it from the yeah, couch, your business sucks. <laughs> sounds just about right yeah but it's crazy to it's like really illuminated that that's sort of the reality of you know how things are set up now right yeah i think so it's um i mean i think it's i mean the all the other thing is it's just it seems hard for um i think like the bigger corporations and so on will actually get through better than a lot of the small i think it's going to be mm. you know i know a lot of people a lot of people don't like that big corporations are kind of dominating I guess the world space and, and I feel like that's going to um, happen more. I don't really know enough about that, but the, my feeling is that the large corporations will have enough capital so, to survive better than these um, smaller businesses that are mm. kind of um, just struggling to, to get through. So I think it will reshape the world a little bit, but again, that's not my expertise and I don't really have any, um, I don't know enough about it to have strong opinions about yeah. what, what that means like and for the world and everything. So, yeah. Uh, it's interesting though, because I feel like of all the businesses, like you're a business owner and of all the businesses that could have been impacted negatively through coronavirus, owning a martial arts gym in Melbourne, <laughs> that's like pretty yeah. much like if you could click all the boxes of dog shit in terms of this particular yep. situation, you guys just checked them all and you've just had to wear it. It's crazy. Not much you can do really. It's just, yeah. I mean, it, it really sucks. It's um definitely the, well, yeah, to be, it's just, yeah, we lucked out at, in Australia being in Melbourne, you know, there's other, yeah. other parts of the world with similar case numbers, we'd be open, but because yeah. of the way in Australia that, that they're approaching it. Plus, um, the situation in melbourne yeah it's just been it's been really bad so nothing opened since march which is crazy yeah and it's like I remember 
you, you, you know Kamal, right? You, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Um, like, because I remember when his gym, he, he Kamal, <laughs> he traumatized me in Thailand. <laughs> uh, he's a well, he's a black belt now. Um, runs absolute in Shanghai, Shanghai yeah. and I remember they, they 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 shut for three months. But I remember even when they'd been shut for a month, I was like, "Whoa!" Like I can't believe they yeah. like, had to shut their gym for a month. That's like that's so bad. And then now here we are six months later of of that same situation, but but worse, I guess, for us. So. Yeah. Do you? Uh, do you remember uh, the first when Kamal rocked up at the Thailand camp and like he went with me for like the first uh, positional butterfly sparring and you were just like, you know, go 80%. He just fucking ragdolled me around the room and you had to, <laughs> you had to walk up to him and be like, Kamal, 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 he's uh, been training five months. That <laughs> <laughs> was traumatized. He's a funny guy. He's a very um, funny guy, Kamal. Yeah, he, he likes to, he likes to stir people up too. Oh, he's yeah. got a bit of the got a bit of the Craig Jones about him, where like he likes to get people in weird submissions and kind of taunt them, taunt them while he's got them there, just to um, you know, show show him that he can do whatever he wants against them. <laughs> he's uh like in that scenario, it was he was just a dude with a magnifying glass and some ants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the exact situation that was going down. Um hey, you've the... been uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, oh, go on. No, sorry, you go. You you had a competition recently? Uh yeah, just on the uh on the weekend actually. We were lucky enough to have the state champs up here. That's awesome. And you did well, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I only ended up having the the straight final, which was a little bit unfortunate. But I actually I actually had a like a really bad injury. Um three months ago i fractured my hip and a, a vertebrae and like really did like a, a lot of damage to my my pelvis and the like the pelvic floor you ligaments went, you and... got back got back into motorbike motocross <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so I, i've had two like i haven't i haven't really done jujitsu this year even though it's been open really? i trained in three months i trained four times so before the state championships i just i rolled four times essentially Jeez. And, um, and yeah, I just, but it was one of those things where I was like, I haven't completed, competed at blue belt yet. And, uh, and then obviously was doing well the last time I was competing and I was like, man, I just don't really want to let this go on too much longer without competing again. And then obviously with COVID and everything, I was like, well, there's a comp, I'm just going to do it. Whether I'm sort of, um, whether I'm, you know, been training or not. And, uh, it was funny. I was actually talking to Andrew and like, cause I've single X was kind of what ended up getting me the finish. And he's just like, he's like, it's funny. You just go back to the thing that you've probably done the most, which is single X because for 10 days, yeah. it's literally all I did. And, uh, and, <laughs> and yeah, like it, it was, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. Like, I think one of the things that obviously we don't have uh, too much time today and it's not like a full, just a jujitsu podcast. And I think one of the things that I was really thinking about to like a way to make this at least the initial stages of this conversation um i guess profitable for people that may do motocross or or other sports i, th I think that one of the things that really interests me with your approach is that you're very you're as interested in what you're learning uh as how you're learning it and i think that that's something that i've picked up from you and I've got back into motocross a lot more recently, um, but I'm finding yep. myself really trying to take the philosophies that I actually did learn from you uh, in Thailand and then obviously just to continue to follow like your, your teachings, I guess, over time. Um, but I think that the way you learn is almost as important as what you learn. And I think that um, just your general, the amount of time that you spend studying. Um, I think that it's sort of worthwhile for anybody doing any sport to kind of pick that brain, I guess. Yeah. I think, um, having done, I mean, I've, I've done sport all my life. It wasn't always jujitsu, probably not until I was 15. I think I started, but yeah, I always approach sport as kind of like, it's something that you try to do 
you know, yeah. you're in there and you try and win, you try and win and that's how you get better. <laughs> yeah. Whereas I think jujitsu is definitely a, it really, um, I think it just kind of like highlights how important like doing something, you know, you, you go against someone and it's quite clear that if they do it right and tick all the boxes along the way, it works for them and they're able to just repeatedly beat you. And then, so you kind of realize that unless you make sure that, you know, you're actually doing the steps along the way, for example, with the technique, unless you're actually doing the technique properly, mm. you're not going to beat that person. So I think it really highlights that. So then that then gets you into thinking about, well, what's the best way to, to learn and approach actually, you know, learning new techniques. So what's the, how do I actually choose what techniques are good and what, what's, I'm saying techniques, I mean, it can be concepts or, yeah, um, yeah. I guess any, just anything bites, related bites to bites of information, it, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So which information are you choosing to, um, to use? Um, and then how are you to go about the, the thing that you want to implement into your game? How are you going to actually go about what's the process you have of, of making sure that you can add that new skill set into your game? And I think that's, um, it's, a, it's an area. I mean, I definitely, it's something I, I've certainly thought about a lot and I've tried to do you know, a decent amount of reading on it. But I'm, I think in the end, it's most of what I have is just like, it, it, it ends up just being my opinion, my my experience of, of what you should do. There's, there's kind of, an, mm. I think like sometimes we get in, like sometimes get into discussions with people. I'm like, you could be right. I could be right. <laughs> um, and it's kind of hard to say, and it could be different for each individual as well. So, yeah, but I think it's really important that you are actually, that for each person that they actually work out what does work best for them mm. and not just go in and kind of just try and win um, and focus on winning and not actually focus on the, the steps that are required towards winning. Yeah. And I think that it's important as well to break things down because the further into, uh, I guess, you know, if you look at, let's say motocross as the blanket term, like this is what I'm doing. Yeah. I am riding motocross. And then it's like, okay, that's one complete thing that you are doing. And you can say the same thing for jujitsu. I am doing jujitsu. But inside yeah. of that that thing, that complete picture is like an infinity of options and ways that you could do those things. So I think that mm -hmm. what, what you said about like, I used to just go and try to win. It's like, I kind of feel like I had that same mentality. And even to the point where, to put it into like a motocross terminology it's like i would just go and do motocross and hopefully by doing motocross more i just got better at motocross and <laughs> you could think the same with jujitsu um if i just go and, and do, roll i mean that yeah and the funny, funny thing is you do too though like as in like yeah. you can get you know and i think there's there's some people at the world championship level who i think probably have approached it like that um but I also think those people, are, you know, to, to get to such a high level with that training mindset, you kind of have to be a little bit gifted in that way. You know, like yeah. that's, you, you know, you're, you're just, some people, they just train and their brain, like they might not be consciously doing it, but their brain is like processing what's going on and figuring out like patterns and, yeah. and things to do and how to, to solve that. And other people, for whatever reason, that happens to a lesser extent or, barely happens at all and it has to go through like a you have to consciously be working on something and then that eventually becomes subconscious and eventually it happens without you actually having to mm. to think about it and you can be focusing on the next challenge and i think for, for the most people i think the second way is more common and i think that's the way that you end up you know if you want to beat the first guy it's not by training harder than them it's by training smarter than them you know like the person who gets it naturally you're not going to beat them by going and rolling harder and trying to win more, you're yeah. going to beat them by uh, having the right strategy and approach to your training and making sure that you are, you know, able to learn at a rate that is, is faster than them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, when you, one of the things that I think I learned from jujitsu and like, I can see this just in, well, I can, you can see it with anybody like a, and a real easy, um, I think a real easy and obvious way to point this out is like when somebody does a back take and then you can see at like a white belt level, 
their or like an intro sort of level it's like where they're putting their hooks in is like essentially at people's thighs there's like this motor yep. connection in their brain where it's like oh that's what I've, I've got to get to there and then you start to see these yep. higher level guys like if you ever see somebody like yourself or craig take somebody's back it's like the heel makes contact with the person at like their chest and then sort of works its way down into that position and there's just like yep. this inherent like dexterity um and like proprioception that's just been created over so long and you look at it and to put that into i guess like a motocross sense or any any kind of like action sport sense you'd call that style but essentially style yep. is just a, a position it's a physical position that your brain gets in without even really having to think about it and you look at the best guys in the world roll and you're like oh look at his style or look at you know the way that he moves and i think that um what that to, that seems like secret source that just that person's got and they're born with it and like you said there's some guys that kind of just do have that from the jump um but i can even like notice it in myself in that exact same example like a uh, look at myself doing like a back take and it would be if i get it right it's like you kind of roll and you sit through and you put your knee in behind their head and then you roll to the other side and then that same leg goes over and it and it hits them really high up on the chest and there's no way that they can close the space and it's like you do it right but i, I think to yep. put it into a training sense that's just doing the right movement and hitting that position over and over and over again and i think that through that like seeing that process in myself because it sort of is unconscious i guess in a way um yeah that i can like apply that back to other things and i'm like oh all of the good guys are just getting into the right positions at the right time and that's what's making yep. them look so good so it's like if you aren't one of those people that just has that secret source how can you just break things down into these achievable positions that you can replicate over and over again yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, um, and, and kind of on that, just having these set, I guess you could call them like, um, you know, like if you're, it's kind of like, it's kind of like even just like a jujitsu match, you could think of it as like a bunch of little goal setting things that you kind mm. of do. You have a bunch of goals along the way. Like, yeah, I'm going to get to, um, you know, I'm going to get to the leg drag position, then I'm going to get the hip, then I'm going to get past, and then I'm going to try and isolate the arm and then I'm going to, um, you know, finish the armbar, but like, instead of, I think the, the better you are, the, the better you are, the, the more small your next goal is, you know, like mm. usually like, you know, I, I guess you see this, you know, someone who's just started, like they go, they try to look for the submission as the first thing, like, you know, let they yeah. shake hands. How do I submit the person? I'm trying to grab that. You're trying to grab the arm and twist the arm when they don't have nearly the position for it then you eventually learn, oh, I've got to pass the guard. So they try to like throw the legs out of the way to pass the guard, you know, like one big movement. Yeah. And then you look at like a black belt and it's like, you know, I have to like circle my hand on the foot. That's, yeah. Until I do that, I'm not going to, until I circle the foot off my bicep, I'm not going to move uh, to the next step. Okay. Once I've done that, then I can, you know, try and, you know, put my elbow close to my hip and then i can <laughs> there's like yeah uh, little uh, i think I, I really feel like the better you get the more small these battles are and they're really important because like if you it's don't like, win the control for your elbow to your hip for example yeah and you keep going forward someone who's better than you will make you pay for that so you have to actually like try to tick all these small mm. boxes on the way to to uh, uh, what eventually becomes you know it looks as a bunch of small movements but it, it ends up being much more efficient yeah so that i guess speaks to the the saying that you don't know what you don't know so like is yeah. at, at the start it's like eating a pizza with your hands as opposed to chopsticks and just picking every little it's like you just see these um i guess it's like you just see a slice of pizza as opposed to this thing that you could like break apart bit by bit or taking like centimeters instead of millimeters yeah exactly <laughs> But it'd be like, yeah, it's and, like, and it's, you know, oh, sorry, Lucky. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of never ending too, you know, I think you mm. know, even after seven, 17 years of training, I still notice new things and learn new things all the time. And, 
you know, slight, sometimes it's uh, usually, I think, I think generally the things you learn are, start getting smaller as well. Like, oh, okay. Like if I, you know, if I just do this little thing, it makes, you know, the whole process a lot easier, but often something very small as, as you get better. But sometimes, you know, even then sometimes someone comes up with a totally different approach and you go, geez, that's quite different, but that's, um, that can be really effective. So mm. I think that's what, what I really like about it is that, you know, it's done it doesn't get stale. I feel like you can always have something new to work on or mm. different aspect to, to play. And so like in terms of, if you were somebody that was interested in progressing, um, in like any chosen sport, do you think that you're better off than to just break down the game, uh, into as smaller chunks as possible and just focus on doing a lot of small things, right. And then the big picture will come. Or do you think it's easier or like, what's the balance there as a mm, person yeah. that tries to get better? Um, I think, no, I think, um, cause if, I think if you start, even in, with jujitsu, like I don't recommend someone who, like mm. I wouldn't take a fresh white belt and teach them about like, you know, how do I put my elbow here to circle, a, you know, this very specific scenario um, that, may be really important to me as a black belt to beat another high level black belt mm. um when when they don't yet have just like the broad stroke mm -hmm. general idea and movement so i, I kind of feel like you want um I feel like the best way to learn is kind of start out broad and pick the most important things like mm. what what occurs most of the time you can look at competition or whatever like just make sure you're working on something that's actually useful Relevant. sometimes people go off on these tangents and they they work on a, a something that's not really common or um or doesn't come out much or you don't see it often at a high level and then you might be wasting your time so i guess it's like minimizing your time wasting there if you yeah. focus on kind of like you know so it might be at first you might focus on quite broad like you know um uh, when, I, when i say broad it might be give them just the idea that you want to pass the guard. I mean, I think that's yeah. at first is just the, you know, like that's your aim. Like someone's legs are in front of you, you want to pass the guard and then they'll, they'll come up with the, yeah, but like, that's nice. But the person keeps putting their foot here. You yeah, know, like yeah. They keep doing this and then you can go, okay, well now that you understand that problem, we can, it has meaning to you. Now you can, now we actually want to, you know, step into headquarters and then pass and you know, like, which is just mm. an intermediate position, whatever you, whatever you choose. But, um, I feel like the best way is to fill in the gaps based on people's issues. Um, I found that same, I mean, it's not even a sport, but I found the same thing. I tried to learn a bit of computer programming at some point oh, and I tried yeah, to I watch that. a tutorial. Yeah. I tried to watch a tutorial, um, on just, you know, I tried a few different tutorials on just like, you know, I'd sit there and watch it for an hour. And the guy's like telling me that this command does this. And I'm just like, it was, it was really hard for me to retain it. But yeah. instead when I tried to, when I tried to make a computer program and I was like, okay, I need it to do this. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that. Where do I, what do I do there? And then you could look up your ant and someone yeah. will give you the answer. You, like the internet's great for that. And then it would have meaning to me. And those things I would remember really well. Anything mm -hmm. that was like a, a problem that I had experienced, I would remember really well. And I think by doing that, eventually you end up with these tiny, you know, like do that for long enough and you end up with these tiny little small details that do make a difference at a elite black belt level. Mm. Um, but you're probably going to start with the, the major ones. Yeah. And that's a, that's a really good point because my start in video editing and film production, I've never taken one class or I've never done any education around computer, uh, like editing or filming, but I've, if you would like, I would say I'm like a black belt in that discipline. And when I yeah. started, I had absolutely zero idea. I just never done it before, but I knew what looked good. Like I knew what other people were making and I knew, like, I had an idea of, like, if I work with this rider at this track, I've watched enough footage of people, you know, that have made good films that have been, like, a, you'd say, like, commercially viable. So I almost, like, yep. reverse engineered my own yep. education of, uh, you know, of, you know, video editing and film producing. And then once you start to 
I guess you just troubleshoot your own problems, you know, and you, I guess, just yeah. scrounge around for any kind of information that you can. Um, and I've always found that to be the easiest way for me to learn. And those, those problems that are, that stand in the way of something that you want to do, um, often become the ones that you have the most motivation to solve. I mean, I've probably, you could probably put this as a, a similar sort of thing. I'm clearly not anywhere near your level at it, but, um, just like, you know, I, I do some of the editing for my instructionals. And yeah. Yeah. Even just using, um, I use Premiere Pro and, you know, every now and then I'll realize, so obviously a lot of it's just been like that. Like, I'm like, Oh, how do I do this? And I'd look it mm -hmm. up and I'd do it, but then you can go down the wrong path to like, I spent so long doing it one way, which took forever. And then I <laughs> realized I had to have someone else say to me like, Oh, like I do it like this. And they showed me how they put all their sequences, like in the one clip. And I'd been doing them as like separate um, mm. files, but like, and I was like, wow, that's just going to save me like 10 times the amount of work <laughs> from having to like, drag and drop and close out of the program and open up another one when I could have all had that everything available on the one project, like just by doing it right. And I think like the jujitsu jiu equivalent of that would be that I kind of, you know, I went down some rabbit hole of trying to submit someone from under side control or something. You know? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I might've been, I might've been learning like some things that, that about how to like frame and, you know, do certain things, but the overall premise was much better if I had have changed it to, to yeah. submitting from guard. <laughs> so like, yeah. there's definitely a a point in having like, or at least having like uh, having some someone, a coach or like some like sort of influence direction whether, I mean, that you can for, for your media. Yeah, for your media, it might be like just looking at looking at good output. You know, like yes. looking at yep. good film and going, how do I do that? Like, what's what are they doing to make that look good? And and following that and not kind of um. It shouldn't be all purely self-directed, mm. like um, like perhaps mine was. Yeah, that it, case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like just producing something in an echo chamber with no external feedback. You could yeah. just so easily, like, if you create in a vacuum, you could so easily just be creating turd. That this that was a hard one for me because, like, the output of my like the, it wasn't necessarily an output. Like, I didn't think my videos were looking bad. It's just the process by what I was making them were was um mm, was a yeah. much more long and arduous one than it had to be so it's like it's hard to know that until someone actually points it out um or, the, or if you came across a you know it just happened to stumble across a video that you realize you could actually have done it a lot easier but yeah, yeah and and i've had that even when i started doing the podcast um you know even down to like right now i'm live editing this podcast as we go and it's like that's this <laughs> is you know year three into the podcast and i'm at the stage where i'm doing that now and it's like all of the same shit existed at year one of doing the podcast <laughs> but yeah. you know there's just i guess yeah there's just no crystal ball like there is a certain level in which you just have to you know figure those kind of things out out yourself but yeah you're right you you kind of just want to have these like loose guidelines to to work between um that yeah stop you going down these incredibly unproductive rabbit holes <laughs> yeah uh the one i don't know if i've ever told you this analogy but i've i've had this thought of um in in terms of how i like to learn jiu-jitsu because i think i've you know it's been a few years now um and i think that in that time i have learned a lot of things um and i'd say that my knowledge of uh, positions and guards and different concepts. Like I'd say I have quite a thick understanding of, uh, the picture of jujitsu, but in terms of like my physical capabilities to do those things on high level people, that is gonna, that's gonna take years to catch up essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say that, um, the, the analogy that I use or give to people now when I talk to someone that's like starting and wanting to really get into it, I always think that what I would, the, or the way that I tried to approach it was, I felt like at the start, it was like a dark room and then you get locked in this room and it's black and you get given a, a very thin direct flashlight. And then all of jujitsu is projected on the walls, on the ceiling, on the floor. And you kind of get this flashlight and then whatever, let's say you're in a, 
a mount escape class for your first ever class of jiu-jitsu yep. your coach then flicks on this light and tells you where to look on the wall and it's like the, there's a yep. 360 vista of jiu-jitsu but that's the thing that you can now see and then you do another class and it's like you you go oh that's where i was the other day and then you come in the next class and it's over there and that's over there but you kind of don't really see the room like you're kind of learning things mm. and you can if you've got like a really clear flashlight and you've practiced and you know you can point it at that exact spot every single time you might be able to do this mount escape perfectly every time but in terms of you know the overall picture that room is still quite dark to you um so i always I, I guess I had the philosophy of, and this is part of the reason why I wanted to come to your camp that first time is like, uh, give me, give me a, like a fairly dim candle that at least lets me see most of the room. And it's like, yep. I'll just work on building that candle up to be, to produce more and more light over time. Cause I always had this thought yeah. in my head of like, I don't really want to have any darkness around me in this kind of game i'm trying to understand like i'd rather have a kind of a full picture but i might not be able to read yeah. some of the finer print i think that's exactly that's a very good analogy um yeah and, and i think that that's how i'm trying i'm trying to um rejig our, our syllabus for the for the gym but to, and actually just our class structure in general but we, we like we will have the an intro class or an intro syllabus which will basically rotate through someone's first eight lessons. So mm -hmm. they're going to, in their first eight lessons, they're going to learn like how to escape the major positions, what the guard is like, and, and one way to get from bottom to top. So one way to sweep, um, one or two takedowns, um, how to open the close guard, pass the guard, and then like the main controls and finishes. So they basically get like a, not, not much detail with this, just like mm. um, a very broad overview. Like, look, you understand all of the positions in jiu-jitsu generally now. Like, you've got the back, you've got the guard, you've got top, you've got bottom, you've got side control, mount. Um, so wherever you are now, you should be able to like, wherever they end up, if they get put in spider guard, they should at least be able to know, oh, I'm in guard. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they yeah. might not know the name of it yet, but at least they kind of, they've got like a reference point. They just don't have a lot of detail about that. And then the next layer so that's like kind of that's the intro and then the next layer is a uh, fills in more gaps so there might be a few different you know some of the main types of guard you might go butterfly guard and close guard and half guard you could do it something as that you know um but just to, you know now you're learning some you kind of um yeah putting the spotlight on each of those positions you've already learned and breaking yeah. them down into subgroups yeah and then again you know in a, in a more detailed um or another rotation of that as you get further along it becomes um more detail but it's, at a certain point actually i think we have to at some point stop trying to learn everything mm. and start to build your game because i think that's a pitfall people run into too you know they try to there's no point knowing one move from butterfly guard half guard spider guard mm. delaheba guard um single X, like if you only know one move from each of them, you probably aren't very threatening. Mm -hmm. If you know, if you have a system from butterfly guard and that's all, you know, you're probably more threatening than the person who knows one move from, uh, from all the different guards. So getting a, a general broad overview, but then starting to develop a system. And then once you're comfortable with that system, like choose a, a system that's adjacent to that, you know? So if you're learning mm. butterfly, single leg X might be next. They work really well together. Um, and now you're becoming really threatening and then you might work, um, something adjacent to that. Once you learn single X, you might start doing 50, 50 or, yeah. um, De La Hiva or something else that kind of starts to get close to that. And you can, um, expand out that way while remaining a very threatening and, and good, uh, competitor because i think the, uh, that and that's actually been probably the most difficult thing for me as a coach is struggling because i want to teach i want everyone to have breadth like i want i want to teach i don't want anyone yeah. into the gym in the gym to not know what uh you know how to deal with the crucifix position for example like i, I imagine going in a tournament someone puts you in crucifix and you've never seen it <laughs> you know? like yeah. i want everyone to be exposed to it but at the same time, I don't expect everyone to actually use it. It might be one percent, it might be five percent of the gym that actually 
uses crucifix as a position. Mm. So how do you balance that? And then when you've got, especially for the advanced people, when you've got all these individuals who each should be working on their own system and specialty yeah. in the same class, how do you teach to that class? That's the, I think the most difficult um, thing about coaching in jujitsu. And yeah. I think, to be honest, I just think that this, my, my answer to that is that classes are not the best way to learn jujitsu. Like literally... they're good, but was... <laughs> as in like, like having me there teaching one thing to everyone yeah. is not the best way to co- to teach to individuals. You know, if, if, if you have individuals who are self-motivated and they know what they need to work on, mm-hmm. they should all actually come in and work on their own thing. And I can just kind of help out when needed. You know, that would be ideal. Yeah, I was going to say. Not comes to class, but they, <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say, like, I think that, you know, the perfect, like, in, I mean, I wonder too, it's just like, essentially, I'm still a fucking baby in the, in the game. But I mean, I, I think like, if I could say, what is my, like, ideal way that I could now do jujitsu, or like, if I could ideally learn, what I would say is I would go into a class with good like high level people and i would do specific like my dream set up for a class would be like okay there's five minutes on the timer you i go essentially it's like a roll and then first five minutes is the highest ranked person's turn to do whatever they want second five minutes is the bottom as the like the lower rank and then i get to say like hey i'm working on uh worm guard and I would like to start at the very end of all the grips. Everything is set up. And then we spar from yep. there. These are the parameters. If you can escape or like, you know, let's say, um, get me to a smash position where I can't get my guard back. Then we reset. If I submit you or whatever, yep. then we reset. And then you just slowly peel back these layers to where it's like, okay, I don't have this guard anymore, but I've got the lapel and a foot on the hip. And then you peel it back even further. So I think that you could really work backwards by having, I guess, more control. Starting with yep. more control, you're creating more time. Because I think that in with surfing, like I really, um, really loved surfing. And one of the things when I first started, I was like, man, if I had a fucking jet ski and nobody else in the lineup and I wasn't limited to the time, because there's like a sweet spot where you're learning something, I feel like in in an activity and the sweet spot of when you're learning how to surf is when you're standing on a wave and i think that uh but that would be the smallest percentage of time that you spend um while you're actually surfing if you look at between driving to the beach to then you know so the the point where you most improve at any sport is often the uh point in which you spend the least time during the activity and i think Mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu is the same way to where the time that i would most improve is um let's yeah like a maybe a a worm guard's like a good example or like something like that because it's quite a grip intensive process to get there and it's like you need to to learn how to use that control you've got to do so many other things right before you can actually start to kind of learn this new thing that you you want to learn. So for me, ideally, I'd get to choose to, you know, let's say I'm going against like, yep, Lockie, me and you are up. Um, I want you to be in, in worm guard and I want to have your posture broken to here or I want to sort of start with this angle. Just make it as difficult as possible for the other person to give you the most time and control in that position. And then you slowly peel back the layers to where you don't have any grips and then you can start to work towards that position yeah absolutely yeah i mean so that's i mean that's what we would say is um specific training we do we do quite a bit of that that type of training where you know you choose if, if you get five minutes working your position and mm. your partner gets five minutes working working their position um and that is really good um i mean because yeah like you, you're right it is uh just from rolling you know it's sim- similar to a wave if, you, if you're working your if i'm working my arm bar and in rolling, I could roll with someone and I get one shot at an armbar for the whole, it might be a 10 minute round and I get mm. one chance at it. Even though I'm trying to work it, I still going to get one chance. Um, and that's not enough to really, to really learn like the new enough to, yeah. Like, you know, someone to scare that I go for my armbar, I miss it. Like 
what went wrong, what adjustments did I need to make? Mm. Like I don't get enough time to practice those adjustments. And, and, uh, you know, where if I spent 10 minutes instead in a row, starting from the armbar and the person might get out the same way three times in a row after mm. that, I'm starting to see like where the, I start to see what point I feel like the grip slipping. I start to change angles. I try going left, right, forward, back. And, um, by doing that, I start to hone in on why they're escaping. And then hopefully, I mean, ideally by the end of the 10 minutes, you start finishing the armbar a lot more yeah. than you started. Whereas just from a, from a role that doesn't really happen as well. I mean, it's still, you can still get some feedback, but it's not, I think it's a much slower process to, to learn than, than that specific training example. Yeah. And then I think um, that, and I think you, I mean, if, you're, if you're talking about other sports like motocross, like, you know, if there's a, it'd be the same thing. If you've got like a, I'm, I don't even know anything about it, but you've got like a particular corner that yeah. you have trouble on, like, like go there and keep doing that corner. You don't like do the whole track yeah. and then get to practice the corner once and then do the whole track again. You want to like keep doing that corner until you know exactly what you're meant to do there. Um, and then you can go and do the track afterwards. Well, that's a, it's yeah, that's exactly the way that, um, like I've never done that until recently. And in this last yeah. crash, especially, I was like, okay, fuck, I'm just not going to go and ride all like constantly. Like, I think that's the one takeaway from, well, I think the fitness side, um, the, even the reason I'm doing motocross more now is that I'm just so much fitter and there's just such a, like a crazy demand on your forearms. Like people that do jujitsu, like you would have no idea. I don't think at this point after seven years of jujitsu, just how, incredibly fit your forearms would be and i had no idea either like i struggled with forearm pump my entire life riding motor motorcycles and then as soon as yeah. i started jiu-jitsu and it was like you know kind of put 12 months into it and then went back on the bike i was like what the fuck i can hang on to this thing now but <laughs> but that was awesome. as aside from that one of the takeaways that you know i took back into motocross was like oh man, I just, I don't drill. Like drilling doesn't exist and not even drilling is probably the wrong word, but like that specific training because, you know, just the other day I did exactly what you said. There was one corner on the track. I rode it the week before and I, I only just did laps. And so it's essentially like going to an open mat and only, you know, and then you get swept the same way every single roll, but then you don't stop yeah. to work on, you know, why you got swept. So I went there the next day, I rode until my arms got kind of tired and then I just went and I hit that exact turn probably 45 times, I reckon. Like I probably spent 35 minutes doing it. And, uh, and then lo and behold, it made the, when I went back and did more laps, I rode better in every single turn because I sort of just awesome. went down a little bit deeper into like the metaverse of what's actually happening as opposed to just staying yeah, yeah. on the surface so you learn level. A, you learn a, you're learning, you're honing in a skill set that's broadly applicable, I mm. guess. Yeah. So, but yeah, and I think yeah, that absolutely. it's hard to, it would be the, the business of running a jujitsu gym is not exactly always um, conducive to like that environment. You can't rely on people like if if i went to that class right now walked into a class with you and that was a structure i'd know exactly what i wanted to work on and i think i've even got yeah. the enough knowledge about what i want to be good at to where i could start to you know dive a little bit deeper i, I wouldn't need to be essentially uh coached initially i don't think but then once you start diving deeper and then you start to run into roadblocks that's when having a world-class coach um, that can just specifically focus on exactly what you need, then that would be like the the ultimate sort of benefit, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, the, yeah, as I said earlier, the, I, th I feel like the, the biggest issue running that type of class is because uh, we do run classes like that where we let people kind of come in and work what, what they want to work in both drilling and, and specific training. But the, the biggest issue is people coming in just kind of like, Oh, you can tell they haven't been thinking about what they want to work on. And so they're just like, oh, I'll do. Yep. Can you still hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah. I got, yeah. Hang on. I think, yeah. I thought my dog was in here, but he's not. I got to let the dog in. <laughs> Hang on two sets. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that is like, I guess the, the kind of catch with it is then you're relying on people to be very like self-motivated, self-sufficient. And, um, 
you know, like camp requiring them to do their own sort of homework. And I guess just not everybody's that invested in, in their sport, you know, so to some people, that's not even the idea it, of fun. And it's hard because not even like, not everyone plays the same game too. It's, I think it's probably different to a lot of sports. I, I imagine like if I, if I can take the thing you're working on in, in motocross, like that particular s- corner or skill set, like everyone has to be good at that. Right. Mm. Whereas like you could in jujitsu theoretically, like, like you could say like the back, for example, like finishing from the back is like a important skill, but there's some people who will not even take the back if they get, there's some like guys like Orlando Sanchez, who like, like a lot of kind of wrestlers that would rather mm. pass and stay inside control and do a Kimura. And there's some people that, um, there's some people that won't even really come on top to try and pass. They'll just try and like bear bolo to take the back. There's, you can, it, whatever I choose in class, if I chose just like, okay, everyone's working this, then it still might not be something that's useful for everyone. <laughs> Even if I try yeah. to pick the, the most common thing, I suppose there are some, uh, there are some things like that. I suppose. Like, I mean, I think, I think everyone has to be good at escapes. Um, I, think, yeah. I think that's the kind of thing you need to be like, you know, whether you, whether you like to take the back or not is your choice, but you have to be good at escaping the back or opening the closed guard or yeah. um, those sort of things that you can't really, um, avoid having to to develop some sort of skill set for those things yeah yeah i think um one of the other things too that i probably didn't put priority on uh until i guess until i just got tested with these injuries this year really is just the i think there's just like a a headspace that you've got to try and be in from an early stage to like just stay in the game essentially because I mean, there's, and I mean, people were saying it to me when I first started jujitsu that like, I just was so into it and I was competing a lot. And I just was like, you know, it's hard to, it's almost like quitting sugar just so unequivocally. And then you're <laughs> like, man, at some point you're going to slip or, you know, that kind of thing. And I, nowadays, I think that there's probably a very beneficial mindset that you probably have to adopt early on that is just, yeah can just see that big picture in that long game i'm not sure if you ever had that kind of similar i don't know thing come up but is there like a mindset that you need to adopt that helps you stay in the game um that's a tough one i mean i i always i think i always looked i I mean i think some people get you see some people go and compete and then they lose and then they um kind of lose motivation and those sort of things and I, i really feel like I never had, I always had that mindset that, you know, I'm training to whatever I'm working on. It's so that in like two years time, I'm pretty good or five years time or whatever. Like I always had kind of a long, a longer view of it. So, um, obviously, I mean, don't get me wrong. I still would, you know, like if I have a bad day at training and you know, I, nothing works what normally does. Like, and you feel, sometimes you feel like you're, you're not getting better. Like I still get frustrated, but, um, but knowing that, anything I'm working on or whatever is, is for in two years time or a year's yeah. time or, or whatever you want to like, you know, putting some longer term goals on, I think takes pressure off what you're doing, you know, on, on focusing on your results that you achieve right now. And, and, and it starts to make sure you actually work the thing. Okay. So in two years time, what do I want my grappling to look like? And, mm. uh, and then you can actually work on those skills. Cause you know, that that's, that's what it's all. Um, that's where it's all headed now. So it kind of detaches you from the immediate result and lets you focus more on the, building the skills for the for mm. future results. The, uh, a really, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's like, sorry. Oh no, sorry. That's um, yeah, sometimes hard with the delay when you do them online. Um, yeah, sorry. the, uh, one of the, the things I can relate back to that is when we're in Thailand, you are really working on your flexibility. Uh, and I really adopted that as well. I was just, it made sense what you, the, in, you know, in the way that you explained it to me. And it's been something that I really have worked hard on. And it's nice. funny, this, you know, this uh, period where, you know, pretty much haven't been able to train this year from injury. And then even to go into this competition and even just the, the couple of roles that I'd, 
I rolled twice the week before this comp, and that's what made me want to go in it. I was just like, ah, oh, fuck, all right. I can, I can do it, but because I had, it was actually just because I was real flexible. I was like, man, even though I've been injured this whole time, like all I've done is stretch, <laughs> and I feel like I'm better at jujitsu purely because I've spent this entire, you know, eight or nine months off with injury, just stretching, and now this exact same jujitsu that I've got from back then is actually better than it was purely because of flexibility and that was something that in thailand that was a long-term goal it was almost you know two yeah. years ago i think it's i mean flexibility is a perfect example because you're not going to see immediate gains really well, you can see like after a few weeks you can see like tiny you know it can be tiny gains but they're probably barely noticeable in your actual mm. game but over you know over a year it will be noticeable improvements in um, and obviously that's um obviously flexibility is not technique but what it does is it gives you greater freedom to it gives you more opportunities to do techniques sometimes where where you wouldn't be able to apply a certain technique because of your limitations now you can because you can actually move your leg further and get it into position more so um, and the you know some some things that might not have been available available to you in terms yeah. of the actual type of technique that you play become available. So I, I really think it's um, I mean I I think it's baffling that any high level jujitsu or grapp grappler would not be doing flexibility training because it's just like there's it doesn't make you particularly sore or anything compared to doing like a, a strength workout. Yeah, it, it improves your and it improves your game. So it's, you know, I think it's, um, I mean, I, I'm surprised I didn't, I wasn't always doing flex, uh, work, working on my flexibility. So, um, I probably could say the same thing to myself, but I think my, by not doing it was silly. Yeah. I, I definitely had the, what I took away from Thailand and I've, I've spoken about it on here before to try and just encourage people in general to work on flexibility, because I think that it's funny. So the injury that I had, so I, I crashed, I landed on my hip. Um, I basically fractured the hip on the side that I landed on, but I tore the adductor muscles on my right, uh, side of my groin. So, cause it was like a shearing injury. So like I hit on this side and then the hip dropped down this side. And then because like my oh. right adductor wasn't, uh, flexible, I actually tore that muscle quite badly in like the tendons that attach to the pelvic bone as well. So like yep. in, in a, you know, in a motocross sense, it's like, well, flexibility is going to allow you to hit the ground and talk your, you know, you're going to have access to more mobility um, before you're going to reach the point of injury um, in terms of like an impact sport in, in the way that motocross is. But when I look back now, that was one area of my, stretching that i was just I'd, I'd hit a roadblock like i had an impingement that was hitting in my hip and i'd sit and do a butterfly stretch or i'd try and do like side splits and the pain i, I could not get pain at like a stretching pain in my adductors because this impingement in my hip limited the mobility so you know even in a, a sense of injury like it's very very obvious to me now the importance of having access to that full range of of motion you know yeah. i think that in a technical sense in jiu-jitsu that there's a, like huge advantages but then just in sports in general just having that access to your full range of motion just can prevent so much shit from going wrong yeah for sure but yeah it was yeah, definitely think, um... oh sorry lucky sorry yeah i think well i mean i think yeah, jiu-jitsu in particular is somewhat unique in um yeah, compared to some sports in that um like if you look a lot at the a lot of the um uh injury print for example uh in in sports like australian rules football and you know or any sort of sport like that a lot of the time in those sports they're not really being asked to to go into the extreme range of motion you know like they're yeah. just running you know yeah. like they're just running and turning left and right so a lot it kind of makes sense that some of the studies that show like the stretching reduce the chance of injury and so on uh, or improve performance in those sports don't really show up too much a result because they're not being asked to like mm. their, their body doesn't demand to go out of that but something like jiu-jitsu where you really 
uh, you are being asked to, <laughs> to well, yeah. you don't have to, but like, you know, depending on your style, but like you can certainly choose a style that requires more flexibility. And that generally uh, is a, is a um, better thing to choose if you have the available range. So um, both for injury prevention and, um, and performance, I think it's, it's useful. I definitely had the the thinking as well. Um, and it was, I'd say, like largely due to the Thailand trip. But I just sort of would even notice, like in particular, one of the boys in our gym, he's a black belt um, lightweight and he's a Brazilian guy. Like he did jiu-jitsu with the Meow Brothers, like in Brazil, they trained together when they were like, you know, <laughs> eight, nine years old. Awesome. And um, he is just so incredibly flexible and... I would look at the, when we would roll the, I'm just like, man, like this flex, like flexibility is the technique here. Like that's all you're doing is you're just like putting everywhere I go. One of your limbs is there. And I don't think yeah. that that's possible. I think I'm beating you to this place, but then a limb arrives that stops me yeah. from yeah. reaching my objective. And, but then I'd talk to him and be like, Oh, tell me about your flexibility. Like, how do I get like that? He's like, oh, bro, just just train, you know. I just I don't do shit. <laughs> and then that clicked. Yeah. I was just like, okay, so what's happening here is you've been doing jujitsu so long, you've just been getting stretched. Like, yeah, you're not you you might not stretch, but you've been getting stretched for this entire time. And now, as a result of you doing this sport, you have uh, become insanely flexible, and now that gives birth to you've just got access to more technique at more times essentially and then i was like okay i want to be a blue belt then with black belt flexibility and i'll just try and do the same you know that i want to i'll do the same knowledge and the same movements that i've got um but now i will just try and do them like let's say i don't improve at all in any skill um but i really drastically improve my flexibility which everybody has access to then, you know, in, in my mind, that would make me quite uh, like a much better jiu-jitsu player. And it's just funny that, you know, through injuries and stretching, that kind of, in a small sense, worked out to be the case that I feel like I'm rolling quite good, even without training. But there is one noticeably large um, change, and that's just like physical flexibility. That's really good. But it's just interesting to find those, you, you know, and if you can hunt out those, like in my head, I'm like, what's the, obviously it's not like you stop stretching, but it's like, what's the other things that you can sort of do? And it goes back to what you said before is like smarter, not harder in terms of training. And now, you know, after sort of going through that, it's like, how can I apply that same theory to maybe other things that I've just, I've never thought about in that same way? Yeah, it's interesting. You got, yeah, any yeah. <laughs> you got any Sorry. ideas? You got any ideas? You got any ideas on that? Oh, is there, is there any other? Oh, um, because oh, do, that does know. seem I mean, like I, a I big think, obvious um, one. Yeah, it's fle- flexibility. I mean, I think I think it's different to strength training. Like, I mean, obviously, like that's that's an, we were just talking about attributes right now, but um, like getting more strength can obviously you can. Like, uh, you can, in some ways you can finish a technique better if you're stronger in that, like, if it's not perfect, you can still, <laughs> you can still yeah. kind of make it work. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think that can lead to issues because then when you're training, if you're relying on that, then you might actually be hindering your ability to, to develop the technique better. You know, and you think you get like a false positive where you think you did yeah. it right because you were successful, but it actually most maybe maybe majority came down to strength and if you actually fought someone bigger or someone equally as then it wouldn't have worked and that's that's a real issue so uh, whereas flexibility is really it's different to that in that um that's that's you like that's your ability to do a movement you know so it's actually like part of the technique um to, to some degree um so I don't think it's the same for strength and not 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 that you know I think some people do strength training I I personally don't do um strength training but i don't see an issue with people who do i think it's um it's kind of a choice if people find it helps then they should um otherwise there's i mean there's other things like i mean uh, probably just like we're talking about like things outside of 
tr- actual training itself, I guess. Mm. Um, studying tape and those sort of things is getting your your brain to um, kind of see the movements and get used to them and, and those things. I think just watching a lot of tape, you, yeah. you learn you learn a lot. Just seeing the postures, there's 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 ways to kind of I think actually enough of it. You're almost like it's like it's like you're trying to predict if you if you're watching it and you're trying to put yourself in their shoes and predict like what's going to happen in this scenario mm. based on who's got the grips and what positions they're in, then I think that's like a really good way to learn. And and that's a way of learning without actually going into the gym and making yourself sore and tired. And yeah. Um, yeah. And you can also see what the best guys, you know, you can see the scenario you've been put in, you know, like you've got someone, someone in your gym get catches you in a triangle choke and then you get to go and watch the best guy in the world defend a triangle choke and, look at what they're doing to um to try and defend that and try and take on some of the the things you can see there so i think that's obviously there's a, like outside of training but i think like studying tape and and working your range of motion are probably the most important things there with some people liking to do strength training and some some not yeah the strength thing's definitely interesting man like and you're like the example of the dude that like if anyone can say like fuck strength training i'll just go win i'll go get third at adcc absolute at 77 kilos like you're probably the only dude that can actually say that (laughs) loggy yeah i mean there's definitely there's um it's it's a funny one in that there's like a good mix of high level grapplers that some that do some that don't uh, do it so i think the fact that some do and some don't is a sign that it's not, it's not essential. It doesn't mean mm. that um, it can't help. And I think it's very style dependent, you know, I think, um, yeah. you know, your a lot of the heavier weight divisions. I think it's probably more important because they're both really vying to get on top. Usually whoever gets top position has like a real advantage there. Whereas yeah. the lighter weight division, that's not too important as to who's, bottom or top and, and the kind of skills you're going to use are quite different so mm. yeah um I, I think it's very individual but i'm quite happy to not do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> do you I do think, training uh i've started to a little bit and i started to with um through my injury um because yep. i just i just was determined like it it was and it was just one of those ones where if i didn't do it then i just think that the recovery was just going to be too big like it was just it was a really was a challenge man just to even get i guess anywhere um or like back to physical activity um and i started doing yoga first and then that was really good um i basically was couch bound for a month almost i think where i could get up i was on crutches and i could sort of get around but i couldn't really do a lot and then i just fuck i was my head i was just doing my head in essentially like i just had to do something um, and I got like, a yoga poster and I just would do what I could of the routine and I'd like get up on crutches right. and, and just started working my way through it. And a lot of it was just the first half was sort of upper body. Um, and then I started, I got in the gym and I just wanted to see what kind of cardio I could do. Um, so I got on the rower, um, and then that just turned, I was just like, oh, well, fuck, I feel like if I had like big biceps, that's probably going to help my rear naked choke and dasses and stuff like that so i was like i'll do bicep curls and then yesterday actually was the first day that i did uh deadlift so like that was a pretty big i guess day um but i missed training last night because i was too too fucking sore so you know you it's always like you've you've got this battery in terms of like your body and what you're capable of doing each day so i think that yeah you you really do have to decide like in hindsight, I probably would have rather trained jujitsu than do deadlifts yesterday. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's. A, I mean, I think in a rehab setting, that's obviously a, a completely different thing. Where you know, like it's, it's kind of almost essential to yeah to uh, strength to strength training. But I mean, as I said, I, I think it's um it's it can be a good thing as well for jujitsu, depending on what you're working. I also think I do think there's actually a a baseline level that you want to meet as well Mm. you know like um i think you want to be strong enough that you can pull you can move yourself against a static opponent like let's say um let's say an arm drag for example you know yeah you can arm drag and you can pull your opponent past you 
but what if they don't move? What if they so you got some big heavy person? Like you want to at least be strong enough that if you can't pull them, you can pull your yeah. body weight to your opponent. You know, yeah. if you're not strong enough that you can't pull your body to your opponent with an arm drag, then I think like strength training, or I th- I do think that that level of strength can be attained at least for most people just by training jujitsu. I think if you just yeah. train jujitsu, you'll you'll probably reach that baseline. I hope, but um, maybe you can speed that up by doing strength training or whatever. Then beyond that, it's really like style, you know, like if you've got a style that, um, you know, if you're playing more wrestling based techniques where you want to like, you know, use takedowns and so on and pick people up, it probably does matter more. Um, And certain, you know, I think probably gi and no gi, I think it probably matters more in the gi as well than it does in no gi. The strength? Um, Just because you can, Sorry, strength matters more in there? gi. I think it makes a difference more um, in that when you grip a, when you get a grip, especially if you've got good grip strength. But um, when you get a grip, you can pull as hard as you want, and yeah. it's usually not going to strip. So you can put your maximum uh, force through. Yeah, the gi, yeah. You've got a collar yeah. grip or a yeah. sleeve. Like you, if you're stronger, you can just you know you can put all your might behind it. Whereas no gi, I really feel like, especially once it gets a little bit sweaty, like yes. once you get your grip, if you pull with your maximum force, that just, it usually just slips, you know, has kind of, mm. the grip disappears. So it becomes more of a grip to control and, and kind of track your opponent as opposed mm. to grip to um, force them to move. I mean, not most, gi- most grips in the gi, you don't try to force them to move, but you do get the occasional person who can, kind of grab your arm from one side and <laughs> move yeah. it to the other yeah. <laughs> just by grabbing your sleeve or you get them. Some people do that with your leg. Like, you know, they just grab your leg and they pick it up and you're like, I'm never getting this leg back because you've got yeah. a hold of my gi and it, you know, you're just too strong. Um, so, uh, yeah, I do think there's, there's a slight um, increase in the requirement for strength, but they're also on the other side of that, I think a technical advantage will show up more in um in the gi just because of more from knowledge i think but like uh, you know if i was a if i was to roll a fresh white belt who i know is just going to go crazy they come for their first class i'd probably rather roll them in the gi i feel like there's more handles and it's easier to just like control them and neutralize them in the gi than it is no see i I should be successful regardless yeah (laughs) what am i doing let's hope let's hope but uh, <laughs> but it takes a it's a little harder to get like full control over someone in a in a no gi scenario. So I feel like a, it can be a, a slight skill gap equalizer to a certain extent in no gi. You know, mm. I, I'd ra- much rather fight as a black belt. I'd much rather fight a purple belt in the gi than I would a purple belt in ADCC rules. Mm. Um, except for the heel hook, obviously the heel hook helped me. Yeah, just the the ability for them to slip out of grips, and you know, it can sometimes neutralize what's what's a uh, what's an obvious skill um, discrepancy. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I hadn't thought of it until you were talking just then, but I got a chance to go and watch Alex Volkanovsky train. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, for before he fought Max for the second time, and um, we did the podcast with him, and just man, watching him uh not roll but spar and then once they got into like the wrestling exchanges uh i just saw a totally different thing in terms of like the way to use your hips and it was something that i'd been taught a lot um and you're always taught to kind of you know drive your hips low and but i just for some reason like being in the room and watching somebody that high level doing that a specific skill set and what it was able to do to neutralize these guys that were, he was sparring guys that were a lot bigger than him. It was just like this extremely correct use of technique really neutralized these, um, these bigger guys. And, and that does make sense. So it's like, I could work in the gym to get a lot stronger to just essentially hold a person down with strength. But the way that Volko used his, he held a person down with his hips. And it's like, if you make that, if you make that correct switch technically, 
um, you know, to if you wanted to talk about, let's say, the timeline um, of making that effective by weight training, you're looking at months and months. But in terms of if you teach that correct technique, and so, you know, he didn't even teach me that technique per se, but then when I went back to roll, I just copied what I saw from him and yep. instantly noticed a thing that made me actually feel like I was stronger. Yep. Yeah, I think a lot of what, a lot of what we feel, I think sometimes you roll with someone and they'll go, oh, you're really strong. And mm. <laughs> sometimes that just, sometimes you just got to take that as a compliment as if they mean that, you know, you, if you apply good force at the right point yeah. from, from a good position, it's like, they're not going to be able to move. They're going to feel completely like glued to the ground or feel like their arm is stuck. And some people might think that strength and you definitely, some, sometimes people, I, I think strength would be like, you know, you're fighting the arm and they're holding and you just grab their arm and you yeah. push it out of the way anyway. You know, that would be being too strong. But like if you get good technique, you achieve the same outcome, but not by, but, but more using the leverage than, than um, pure force, I guess. And, you know, I think people, it feels quite similar to the person receiving because they're trying to fight their arm from being straightened. Yeah. And whether it's with leverage or whether it's raw power, their arm gets straightened. So they go, geez, you're really strong. But, uh, oftentimes you, you have to take that as a as a compliment mm, but then think, if you're getting that a lot you do have to wonder if you are using too much strength so, so that's a, yeah. <laughs> the hard one to <laughs> no I, I know exactly what you're saying and i think that the yeah it's the same when people are like oh you're really flexible i think it's just that there can be a point where you're just doing the right techniques at the at the right time as opposed to you know it's not like you know you don't exactly have elite level flexibility yeah, and the flexibility is, you know, if you can have flexibility but not use it the right way and it's not going to mm. help you at all. But um, I think people get frustrated when you are using it the right way and they they maybe see you doing a move that they don't have the ability to do. You know? mm. Like from a position where you can get your leg in and recover because you've been working on flexibility, it's the right, to, absolutely the right technique for you to do. But they see that and they go, well, I can't do that. So therefore you're doing you know you're mm. not cheating but they maybe view it like you know like you're using a move that i can't do this is not fair you know and um so like, yeah that's because i worked my flexibility that's <laughs> <laughs> it's my move now like you can't no matter if i go against someone my size or someone five times my size i can still do the same move it's not like strength that you know is going to matter you know if i'm using strength to get out of something and then i go yeah. against someone five times my size i can't use that anymore yeah but flexibility i can do the same thing so yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, I think too that it, it's a good point what you said about the strength. It's like if it's a whatever strength mixed with technique at the right time can often produce results that far outweigh what strength could alone. And I think that you can look yeah. at that in terms of just like mechanical efficiency. Like there's guys in motocross that are famous for being unfit and it's like one of the most physically... Like I think that there's this sliding scale with it even too, where it's like, if you're shit at riding motocross, it's probably the most physically demanding sport in the world because you've got a complete <laughs> yeah. lack of control. And I think that you could say the same about like jujitsu or anything like that. It's like the more, uh, technically proficient and efficient you are, the less that the, you know, fitness would even come into play. Right. Because it's like, if you don't, if it's not required, because you have a certain level of control over the like intensity and the experience, then like in theory, the more control you have, the less fitness you would require even. Right. Yeah. I think that's the same in, in grappling and jujitsu as well. I think I, I mean, if you just definitely in competitions, but even in training, like I could, I can roll for an hour, you know, mm. and that's like an hour straight and that's, and, and be, you know, and be rolling what i would say is re at a reasonably hard pace but at the same time i'm able to keep that below that threshold of where i'm getting exhausted you know there's a threshold where you go if you go over that you're going to like mm. run out of steam and i think that's just efficiency and i, I remember back in as a purple belt i used to do all these fitness i used to go for hill sprints and um all sorts of like things to try and get my cardiovascular fitness up before mm. i think i was doing the 
the Pan Pacific Championships or something, and I wanted to get as fit as possible. And I did all that, and then like two minutes into the match, I'm just like, <sighs> you know, I'm yeah. exhausted because yeah, because it's really I, mean, I might have been as fit, but I'm my jujitsu wasn't as efficient as I wanted, and so I'm just like gripping things and trying to move and using all this using all this energy when I didn't actually need to if I had had better technique application. So and then mm. compare that to um, black belt level and it, it really i really do think it depends whether you're winning or losing as well because if you're losing you're generally using more energy you're in worse positions you're having to fight and push them you know keep mm. their weight off you and you're like if you're on the back foot you're having to use more energy to try to make space and distance whereas the person who's winning tends to be able to tends mm. to I make mean, it obviously depends but can, can tend to be able to relax a bit more and um and really uh, control the scenario and, and they're generally just more efficient with their movement so they get less tired the only way that re- works in reverse i think a lot of times when you get to near a submission you know, like you, know, you get mount and someone wants to defend and they just put their arms by their side it often it often requires more energy from you yeah. trying to like separate their arms yeah. when they're just kind of doing nothing um same from the back sometimes like holding the back and trying to finish from the back against someone who's being defensive can sometimes be more energy for the um, for the attacker than the defender. But for the general game, I think um, the 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 person who's dominating the grips ends up having to use less energy um, than their opponent, which is which is a big factor as to who gets tired. So I think getting more technical makes you appear fitter, even though you're not. Yeah, and I I I think in my experience, one of the things that I like I actively try to, I try to make people bored when they roll me like half the time too, you know, like I try to make the pace purposely very, very slow for people. And it's like, I think, I don't know what, I don't know what the deal is there. I think like one of my inspirations for that was probably Craig. Like you'd, you'd watch tape of Craig in like big competitions and you just see like this lazy dude and to me it just seemed (laughs) (laughs) but like it seemed really smart to do that and for whatever reason like i think i just i don't know whether i consciously adopted that style based off that or it was just something that i did and then like kind of noticed he did so it gave me like confirmation bias that it would that it's like a good thing to do but i really actively try to make roles as slow and boring as possible to just like create that intensity and i feel like if you're a person that's not used to rolling at a slow intensity then it really like takes people out of out of their game Mm. it's almost like like lulling people into like a false sense of um security in a way but that to me is like and that's why i never really have felt like um i because i i get people saying that i've got really good cardio i'm like fuck if we went for a run man i definitely don't think you would say i'd have good cardio and i don't think like i'd I don't think I'd feel like I had good cardio, but I think there's always just this, yeah, I just try and play a very weird, weirdly slow and boring game of jiu-jitsu. No, I think that's a, a very good way to get technical. I know Craig used to roll like that when he was purple belt. He, he's, he's increased it slowly since, but he's still probably on the, compared to a lot of the elite competitors, he's certainly a more yeah, if you look at like style role. JT Torres to Craig Jones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that that I, I always, I always, I always thought it was um, like I always had the approach of generally, like you know, if you if you're rolling someone who once you get more skilled than your opponent, then your aim should be to beat them with as minimal energy as possible. You got kind of you, like, if, if you're wanting to continue to try to win the role mm. and get like you know like if if that's your goal, then you got like. You can either like try and tap them as many times as you want in the five minute roll. I feel like you don't get too much out of that. I might do that just before a competition. Like if I'm wanting to just be really mm. aggressive and I have to get my game going, but otherwise I always thought that like trying to finish the role, like get them, submit them, but using the least amount of energy possible, mm. which means like going slow and kind of feeling their reactions and leaning your pressure in the right way. And I think you become very, at that pace, you become very acutely aware of exactly where your pressure is on the elbow and, and mm. your hip and things that you might not be aware of when it's all kind of frantic. So 
Uh, and that's where that's I think that that's a lot of, where a lot of those technical adjustments come from because you're um, you're feeling like oh if I just move my pressure I can feel they're trying to move here and I'm going to move my hip a little bit higher and it's in a slow controlled pace and I can feel the effect of that and that makes a difference on how easily they can turn and, and expose their arm and so on so mm. um, yeah I think if, you, if you're doing that that's really good and so how do you balance that though of just like this competitive want to win in the gym and uh, because i feel like a lot of people especially at fuck i almost i just don't almost don't even know if it goes away for you know there's even high level guys but that like what's the balance at at what point do you have to surrender what you'd say would be like the win to sort of go after that and and how do you like how do you reconcile in your head if you you know you want to play that game it backfires like because essentially it comes down to humility but i think that there's there definitely is like a balance that you have to find to where it's like you want to maintain a level of i guess like dominance in the roles that you go against because i think that you want to i don't even know if this is like a dicky thing to say but it's like there's people that you can train with where like you kind of know every time that you're gonna be able to deal with those people to where Mm -hmm you know, you can kind of back it down a little bit, but it's like, if you let them just submit you like four times, then it's probably going to change the dynamic. And then the predictability of, you know what I mean? Like I could go yeah. in here and be able to play the way that you just said, because obviously that's like a way to sort of develop and work on these nuances. Yeah. But I don't know, is there like a give and take there or should you just throw all of it out the window? Like that, all of that ego completely. Um, I mean, I think it's, I think ego is good to a degree. Like, I mean, it's bad in that it's bad if you're not, if it, if your, if your ego stops you from training properly, that's really bad. But I think it is good that like, you know, if you, I mean, I, if someone, if I go, if I roll with someone who doesn't normally submit me and they catch me and then, uh, and I, and they do that again or something. And then I like, I should go home. Like, I think I should go home, like frustrated at that. And that should yeah. be a motivator for me to like sit there and think about it and um and try to improve and but i think like how you approach that then you know like if, if let's say you've got someone at the gym who's got a good straight foot lock i roll with them they tap me with a straight foot lock like i can as as a higher if let's say i you know let's say they're a purple belt and i'm a black belt if they tap me with a straight foot lock i can maybe go, oh, okay, that guy's good at straight foot lock. So I'm not going to go anywhere near that again. And I'm just going to keep the fight, you know, away from that, which will make me probably more likely to win the next time. But I haven't necessarily fixed, there's a clearly a problem there mm. where like we've got, I don't want, I don't want to, I, at least in my head, I'm like, well, if purple belt, Steve on the mat can tap me with a straight foot lock when I'm in that position. Then I it need was to be Andrew, worried wasn't it? if I'm going to go and compete against <laughs> if I'm going to go and compete against um, you know Gary Tonnen or someone. And, <laughs> Killed and him about Steve tap me with a foot lock. Yeah. That's a problem I need to address. So so I'm going to go and try to I might try to go to the same position where it all started to go wrong and then try to win from there. I might like I, I usually like to actually go back into the. Mm. If someone taps me that w- w- where I feel like they shouldn't have, I actually usually like to, even when we're just rolling, I like to like force myself back into the same scenario and and try and get out again. Sometimes that's backfired on me. Sometimes I've gone against, you know, sometimes <laughs> I've had like a visitor from the gym. You get like a visitor in, like you know, I'm remembering like a brown belt once, like a couple of years ago, and he had like the weird loop choke. Yeah. And, like, I'm passing. He got me in the loop choke, and I'm like, that was pretty, I was like, okay. I'm going to go back there again and I'm going to, I'm going to put my head in the same spot, but like, I know what he's doing now. So yeah. I can just like correct my error and keep going, get loop choked again. Nah, bro. I think I have a couple of times and then I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes you got to go like, okay, maybe I don't have an answer for that yet. And the answer at the moment is not to put your head in that <laughs> spot, but it's nice to like, you kind of put yourself there and try to see if you can solve it. And often, often if that happens, I'll, you know, after after the session, I'll try to sit down and go, okay, let's go there and try and you know, I want to figure out how to, how to stop that happening. Mm. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the, what I think is ideal. Obviously you, you have your people you roll with, you know, you got people that you roll with hard. You have people that, you know, there's yeah. some people I'm like, I know that like every time we roll, it's going to be like a, a real war. Cause that's the, you know, that's the style that they bring. 
and maybe the style I bring against them, I don't, I don't really know. And there's other people who I know it's going to be just like a, a slow technical role. And um, yeah, so I think pick your pick your your partners for that too. So if you got, I mean, I think it's good to, if you don't have. I don't think all your roles should be slow. Like you, you got to have some that you're really testing yourself at a mm. at a higher pace, and maybe maybe the majority should be at a at a technical pace. But you still need those kind of those higher higher intensity roles to really test yourself. Mm. What um what's been in your your career as a coach? I uh, based on a, a person that if we want to look just on an instructional type of level as a person that's watched a lot of different coaches and and I've traveled quite a bit like I mean there's people that have traveled a lot more for jiu-jitsu than me but I put you as one of the best coaches in the world for jiu-jitsu um, obviously one of the best competitors as well but what what have you learned in that time like if you could give advice to somebody that like maybe like a young gym owner or somebody that's trying to like build a, a gym like what's mm. some of the most important things you've learned as a coach um and even not even just like jujitsu or class structure or whatever but just as being like as a you know a person that is in charge of like furthering people's development yeah um for that's a that's a really tough one um I'm sure there's a bunch of lessons. In I there, think, but. I mean, if I can talk just, just as a, as in terms of like my preparation is coaching and so on, like, I think having a plan is, is really important. Um, like I, I used to, I think when I first started, I kind of was like, all right, what am I showing today? And you know, like yeah. that was kind of how it started. And what I found was by doing that, I, I say a curriculum. I, I know a lot of people don't like the idea of curriculums and I don't know why, why but uh, actually I, I think like you don't want to just teach a curriculum. Like you should have days where you're teaching other things as well. But um, I used to just kind of go, okay, what am I teaching today? Uh, knee through pass, you know, and, but what it would, what would end up happening was I'd end up kind of choose, always choosing a more um, sexy topic, you know, something that mm. get people excited, you know, or that I was excited in. Yeah. But they end up neglecting the actually important things like, you know, to scale the man back and the thing, you know, if it's, if it's a beginner's class, like some of those things are really important and actually the thing that people need to, to work on. I think it is important to though, like, even though you've got a curriculum, it is important to be looking around the room and paying attention to where people are having issues too. Cause like, if you're mm. looking around and everyone's stuck under side control and you haven't got that in your curriculum at the moment but that's what everyone's having a problem with then you probably need to be to be teaching that um i think lately i'm i'm trying to get more into the, I, I think i mean as I, said, as I was saying earlier the the breadth versus depth thing you know like trying to teach mm. everything but also trying to give people specific games i think uh, as a as a coach it is a good idea to try to teach systems you know like if you mm. can spend a few if you like especially for more advanced group like try to spend a few weeks and have the people that are coming get a full understanding of of a of a system um because then they can really they once they see how everything connects i think it makes a lot more sense to them as opposed to just like linear mm. linear movements and, and techniques um as a coach as well geez um is there anything you think I should be talking about. <laughs> well, I think um, one of the, I think like just maintaining a, a culture because I feel like that's probably the most, yes, yeah. that's probably the most important job that you would have as a coach. And I think that, I mean, jujitsu is especially a bit of a weird one. Like it kind of gets culty vibes at times. And it's like, mm. how do you, how do you have a good culture with people that are, you know, not necessarily concerned about beating each other as much as you know helping each other but then mm. you know it's it's a balance because like the more competitive you get then the more focused you're becoming on i guess outcomes and not losing as opposed to you know you can't yeah. have like a hippie jiu-jitsu school where no one wants to tap each other like there is this kind of yeah. sliding scale that needs to be maintained and i think that that does come from you know the coach and i just i wonder like what if you've even got philosophies around culture in that sense yeah i think i think it's um i mean i 
I'd say, I mean, I think our gym has a good culture. I, I would definitely I don't agree. know how much is that. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've got a lot of, I, I think a lot of it's contagious, you know, like I, I am, um, I'm quite like, a, I guess I'm a bit of a jujitsu nerd. And I think that becomes, you know, uh. if people see me studying a lot and I have good, I don't even think they should look at competition success because I don't think that's necessarily, um, I think Ryan what Hall's a good example be. of that. Like he, he doesn't exactly yeah. have like a competitor's school, you know, it's not like people yeah. are just trying to follow his lead, but he's yeah. obviously, you know, he is one of the best competitors kind of thing. I mean, I hope people don't, you know, um, don't copy my jujitsu approach just because I've had a good, um, Oh, you got lucky, you know, competition recently <laughs> or something, you know, like, I think, I think it should be, <laughs> I mean, obviously like, you know, that, that might happen, but I, but I'd, I'd hope it's, um, more just like, you know, they, they, they see that as a good way of approaching jujitsu. Cause that's how I see it. And that's, they, I think like when they see that it's very enjoyable to like study jujitsu and mm. learn and have techniques you're working on and, and come in like from, from that viewpoint, as opposed to just coming in and trying to just win and it's like you know, like playing a game of football or something where you're just going to go as hard as you can like i think if you go in with that attitude it's a much less enjoyable sport so mm. i think setting a, a culture that way in terms of like yeah people uh, you know some people not tapping or uh, not wanting to roll with certain people and so on um i think i mean individuals are going to be different there i think i think it is really good to do different drills where kind of you're forced to be um mm. I, th I think doing like a lot of specific training is good because you're going to start from bad positions sometimes and sometimes you're going to get caught it's good for the ego that way you know like mm. if we do specific training starting from the back for example especially like the submission based stuff like occasionally even the best guy in the gym is going to get choked or mm. starting from an armbar occasionally you're going to get armbarred uh i think it you know, if, if you've roll, if you're rolling with someone and you know that sometimes they get you and you get them, sometimes I don't think there needs to be too much of a ego thing. I think people get egos when they, you know, like always roll and they never, you know, they maybe always want to win all their roles and they don't get tapped very often and they might be more kind of funny about that. So making sure everyone's constantly getting mm. <laughs> tapped out <laughs> to some degree, I think is good. That um, makes, it makes sense. I'm not, yeah, I've never really thought of it like that, but that definitely does make sense. Like people, you should be getting choked a lot. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think if you're not in I mean, control, it what you're working on, obviously, yeah. but like, but, um, yeah, if you're not sometimes being put in bad positions, then you're not really working all of your game and you got to expect that, you know, um, someone good's going to put you there at least at some point during a match, for example. So mm. having those skills are really important to develop. Yeah. Um, what else for culture? Um, I think, yeah, I think there's just like having, I, I like a relaxed atmosphere at the gym. Like I don't, I'm probably less of like a strict coach that, you know, like I don't, I don't actually, I get annoyed if the pro guys show up late, but no, <laughs> you know, like for approach <laughs> session, but and but like and if like someone's being like constantly late for class only because when someone's late to class they usually miss the technique and then they come in and they're like partner up and they're like so what are we doing and it yeah. actually takes more time for me to go and help them and explain to them what's going on as opposed to like teaching the the class um so if someone's like constantly late i, I try to tell them to maybe get here earlier or come to the next class but i tend to be more uh pretty relaxed generally i suppose just having um that's it i think you have to have some rules though like some boundaries because people will always tr try to push the boundaries this mm -hmm. is just as a coach you know like you know some people i'm personally guilty uh, of that. <laughs> <laughs> have, yeah and it's you know like um i'm trying to think you know like it could be even things like like i like people to be able to um drill what they want for example you know and like occasionally if someone's got a tournament coming up or whatever like i might be teaching a class i'm like hey you know you're, you're competing soon if you want to go off the side and drill mm. um while i'm teaching then then go for it like I, I don't mind that but then if you get like 10 people doing that while you're trying to run a class there's going to be noise and it, like it, it actually just distracts you know from 
from the class environment. So just having like some rules, I think are important, but I overall prefer like a, a reasonably lenient um, mm. approach to running a class. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's just, I, I think it's just something that, um, you know, and, and jujitsu is getting more and more popular. There's more and more schools popping up and there's, you know, there's more and more people that are wanting to open academies and, and that's a good thing. Like I, you know inevitably yeah. the more people that do jiu-jitsu the better i think um because you know i don't think you can get i think it's very rare that if you get a guy that's a purple belt or a brown belt that's like still a dickhead <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah. i think you just have to go through a lot so i feel like the more of those people kind of that have just been through the the um the constant test that jiu-jitsu throws at you the the better but i mean i, I just feel like yeah, if you can be one of those young coaches that is armed with, you know, I guess a bit of knowledge from people that have been doing it for so long, it's probably going to be beneficial for people going forward. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, I think there's a lot of, I think uh, you, you have like some good, you have to have some good personality traits to survive in jiu-jitsu mm. for a long time, or at least it teaches you them. Uh, there's certainly some exceptions where people, there's certainly some people who, get to black belt and they're still a bit funny but, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah like i mean you you tend to have to be i think just from the outset like in jiu-jitsu like you're you've got to be willing to let someone choke you yeah. and you know you're trusting that they're going to let go that you know, you've got to be trusting of your your partners like th throughout like they're actually you're putting your arm or your leg or your neck in danger and trusting your training partner is going to let go when you tap, which obviously they do, but that's a cultural thing on the mat too. You know, like hundred percent. I mean, I, I haven't, I've never been to a gym that had a culture of not letting go when you tap because yeah. I don't think that gym would exist very long, but, but you're like, right. That is a like very a basic, basic starting point. Yeah. Yeah. As a basic starting point, if there's someone who's not going to follow that, then they're out of the gym very, like they're going to get kicked out mm. you know, immediately. You know, like people who are, holding on to submissions too long or something, which occasionally will, will happen, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, there's some general things that try to keep, keep out the, uh, the douchebags. Yeah. One of the, um, one of the other things, um, that I was going to like, maybe get your, uh, wisdom on is the, the comp on the weekend. I definitely saw like a lot of, um, guys that, uh, just couldn't hand like or not couldn't didn't handle the like the nerves of competition um well and these are white belts that it was you know f first competition so it's not it's not like they should be able to handle this situation well like yeah. it's a new situation but i guess like as somebody that's competed from like everybody that does a competition has to do their first white belt competition. So yeah. like we're, everybody's dealt with those nerves, but for you to then take it all the way through to the ADCC podium in, you know, the open weight division, it's like, you've obviously you, like, you've seen every version of, you know, this kind of like, I guess the pressures of competition and like the stresses of competition, like what's mm. something that, um, like I, for me personally, when I did the podcast with Craig, um, it was right before Pampax that first time that I did it. And yeah. he said that he gave me some really good advice of just like really getting like an adrenaline dump out of your system first. Like he said he did sprints, um, for me at the Pampax last year, um, Oh, sorry. Nationals last year. I did like really, really hard rolls. Like me and Andrew probably did a 20 minute roll where we went from flowing at the start to just like belting each other at the end. And that to me was like epic. I felt great after that. And it really did take away a lot of the nerves. But, uh, Craig also said that he didn't listen to music. He didn't do any of the pump me up sort of stuff. Like he just tried to replicate the, the gym scenario as much as possible and you know i was like had the headphones in and was trying to pump myself up and having a playlist and and i think that you know maybe once you get a little bit further on and you've kind of come to grips with the nerves of competition um maybe you could start to introduce those kind of things just by purely by choice but i just think that um that that was something that helped me to just not want to listen to fucking mega death before i roll to like suck me up because yeah. it's just a very unnatural scenario like friday night open mats i'm not putting mega death on, on in my headphones in between every roll you know yeah it's a, 
it's a really tough one. I mean, I think you, you, first of all, even if it's your first comp, you're going to feel you're probably going to be petrified unless you're a strange human that just l- thrives in that sort of environment. <laughs> but most people, most, most people, people are like, you know, scared. And even, even your 50th comp, you're still going to feel like mm. that same effect. It's just dull, more dull. Um, I think it's, it's important to try to realize kind of like what you said, that the, the real issue is that you're training, or at least I, I think the more you train, the more relaxed you are at training, you know, it becomes just like, oh yeah, I'm just going down the gym, you know, like maybe yeah. your first day at class, you're like, whoa, you know, like I'm going to have to fight someone, <laughs> you know, to, at a, at a gym. But once you, once you get used to it, like oh, the, I was scared of um, open mat excitement for yeah. ages and before. The, the, the excitement level kind of goes down and you end up just being very relaxed at training. And then you go into a competition and it's all the way, you know, through the roof, you know, mm. it's, it's very different. Um, which is the, which is a problem. And you, you know, you burn all your energy and in terms of like, so like if, if you're in that scenario, I mean, I don't know, maybe listening to Megadeth, like, cause some people respond differently. Some people kind of like freeze and they don't do anything, you know, like mm. they, they go in their first comp, like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. And they kind of, they're too hesitant. Maybe listening to Megadeth might make you like at least aggressive. <laughs> you might like <laughs> at burn least all the, your energy out. And, yeah. yeah you, you might burn all your energy. And when you think that that's, that may or may not be a good strategy there. It might be better than just freezing and doing nothing. It's very hard mm. to say there. Um, but I think the best thing you can do is, I mean, I, th- I agree with Craig. If you can bring the the level of the competition like down, that's good. Like if you can, you know, I like to grab some, one of my training partners beforehand and move around and roll just because it reminds me that I actually do, you know, I grip, get a grip and all that's right. I do know what I'm doing. It's all these mm. things run through your head when you're just kind of waiting. Like what if they grab this or that? Or what if this happens? If you just grab someone and you're like, that's right. I know what I'm doing. I just need to go out there and, and do that. So to me, that calms me down. Um, so having some sort of role or you can, and actually get a sweat up, I think as well, mm. uh, can be, can be really good. Uh, but then I think in the training you need to, so over time, the, like, you just get a little less nervous from competitions. It never goes fully down, but it will get, it's the more often you compete, the less you seem to worry about it. So mm. I would say compete often is, is going to be a good thing. But then I think what you can also do at the gym is you don't really want all your training at the gym to be down here, you want some of it to be here. So mm. there's not such a shock. You know, if competition is here and some of your roles at the gym can be here, then you're not like feeling too out of your uh, depth and you can make adjustments. Sometimes if you go from like all relaxed roles and then suddenly thrashing and, you know, like it's totally different to anything you've experienced and nothing works. So mm. um, I like for ADCC, what we like, what I liked to do, well, what I did for, for 2019 was um, we got like, we did our pro session and at the end of the pro session, I think it was twice a week in the last eight weeks for the tournament, we would do one simulated fight where everyone is sitting around watching and cheering and the two mm. people in the middle have to fight just to get, like, and you do, you, I, like I would feel more nervous than I would just in a regular role at the gym. Even what, though what, it, what you would you say, what would you say your percentage wise, like, if you had to say the percentage that your anxiety about the role increased in that scenario, just coming off a regular role to that one, like at your oh. level, what would you give that value? I would still say by over 10, cause I'm basically like not anxious at all. <laughs> like just rolling someone in a regular, like it's basically, yeah. Hey, you know, like, so it's going from like, you know, zero to say to one. Yeah. Normally. They'll say, we'll give it a one. Like it's probably gone to 10, you know? Um, yeah. Whereas a competition might be, I don't know, 20, um, 15, 20, I don't know. Like it definitely, yeah. it's definitely not as nerve wracking as waiting for a competition, but it is still, it does actually like having everyone in the gym watching. And I don't know why it just, it is different now, especially when you, you know, you're, you're trying to actually in this scenario, I'm actually trying to imagine I'm at the ADC tournament, you know, mm. I'm trying to increase the level of uh, nerves I'm getting to, to kind of match that a little bit. And so, uh, and then obviously at, at ADCC, I try to bring it down, obviously, but yeah. Yeah. And so, I, th- what... I think, I think, a, I think a problem I've had though before trying to bring the nerves down, sometimes you, you're too slow, you know, like in, in that 
I've had it where I'm like, you know, I want to, I'm too like anxious. I want to relax more. And I end mm. up like reacting slowly because I'm trying to like almost having a deliberate attempt to try to relax. Whereas you really should trying to fight <laughs> like, like you would in the gym. Like when you're in the gym, you're just trying to fight and mm. at the competition, you want to just try to fight. Um, so ideally that's just kind of like, it's a background thing, but not a conscious thing. But, yeah, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So at ADCC this year, then what, like, how did you feel the way you wanted to feel uh, in terms of like, you know, the few minutes before the your matches or the day before? Because like, even for me at this comp, and I think, I think a lot of it, like a lot of, I wouldn't say my nerves went away last year, but when I was competing quite regularly, like it, I felt quite accustomed to whatever the feel, the extra feelings I were, I was yeah. like used to it to where I didn't put much stock into those feelings. But I'd say this competition that just went, there was extra because I was, I guess, out of practice. But would you say you felt the way you kind of hoped you'd feel at ADCC this year? And like, what is your mindset? Um, like, what is yeah, your Yeah, I mean, I was still new. I was, yeah, I mean, probably not what I, I, I suppose it's like expected versus, I mean, what I would want to feel is just like it's at the gym. That would be awesome. But mm. uh, I, I'm aware that that's, that's, you know, going to ADCC and fighting in front of all those people is not going to feel like the gym. So um, yeah, it was probably about what I expected. I mean, I wasn't, I was definitely nervous, but I wasn't like a ridiculous amount of nerves. Mm. I felt less pressure. I felt less pressure in the open weight, to be honest, in the second performance. Maybe that is a sign that I still need to, you know, bring the, the level of nerves down. I mean, there was literally no, I had no expectations in the open weight. So that kind of mm -hmm. um, certainly changed my level of um, nervousness. I wasn't really as concerned about the result. Yeah, I think that that is, that's such a really good point to, I guess, mention is that like, cause I mean, I, I definitely, that was one of the reasons I even wanted to enter the comp this weekend is like, I haven't trained this year. Like if there's ever a time where I can lose, it's this weekend. So like that, yeah. I just went back to that constantly. It became this crutch that I could like, yeah, no, it doesn't matter because I've got every reason to lose. And you being a 77 kilo midget, essentially fighting, uh, like yeah. Ali and you know what I mean? Like you should lose as well. So it's weird that yeah. once you put in a position where, you know, that, you know, like you can say the pressure's off, the pressure really does come off. So it's like, is there a way to hack that state? And I wonder if actually it was the opposite for those guys. I mean, maybe for those big guys, they're like, you know, I can't lose. You know, like they might feel more nervous. True, man. Coming true. out there fighting a little guy who's like, you know, good lax leg locks. You know, like maybe that's yeah, um, uh, works in reverse for them. So yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a good that's a good point. How much time have you got? Have you got a bow pretty soon? Yeah, I got a I got to run a class in four minutes. Sorry. So so we'll, you got you guys have been doing the online morning. thing. Yeah, yeah. So we're um, hopefully we get to open in about two months i reckon but <laughs> so yeah we're still um doing online classes just video analysis class tonight so yeah awesome well hey man i really appreciate um appreciate your time and uh yeah any on any time i get to talk to you is a is a pleasure i love getting to um to to pick your brain and uh and try and take that back to my small jujitsu endeavor that, that i'm on so i really appreciate you um sharing the the, the knowledge that you've accrued over the last 17 years thanks so much for having me on it's yeah it's always good to chat hopefully in person soon either Dude. i come up there or maybe you shouldn't come to victoria you never know what's going to happen you might get stuck here <laughs> like, yeah maybe we'll get out, we'll get out of here once we can we, once we can maybe we'll see well i'd love to short, I, i've got a i've got an idea too i want to do like a i want to do a year's worth of training in a month as like a jiu-jitsu like content kind of piece for the podcast oh, nice. So I want to yeah. do 52 sessions in a year. So uh, in a, in a month. Um, oh. So, you, you know, essentially like once it'd be, I think it's 13 sessions. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's kind of the thing. Like, and it, it's gone like further on the back burner. I was going to try and do it like kind of around now, but part of that, I'd like to invite some people to come and be a part of the training and do the studio like podcast in yeah. the studio. Um, and I think it'd be like a cool way to kind of like show people what, you know, the average guy training, you know, that hard would look like and shed some light on the realities of what you guys do at the elite level. Jeez. Yeah, definitely don't get injured. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, that sounds interesting. Really cool. All right, mate. Well, yeah, say, say, say good day to, um, to live 
for me as well. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll do it again in person 100% as soon as we can. Awesome. Thanks, Jace. Thanks so Take much, mate. Talk Good. to you soon. See ya.